Tonight, Samsung buys smart things, Berlin bans Uber, and what can we learn from the FCC's public comments on net neutrality? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 151 for Thursday, August 14th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by NatureBox. Order great tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like chocolate quinoa granola. Oh yeah. To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Samsung has just bought Smart Things, which is a startup that makes smart home controllers. Purchase details were not made public, but Recode reports sources that put the acquisition at about $200 million. Smart Things, which started as a Kickstarter back in 2012, will continue to be run by CEO and founder Alex Hawkinson and operate independently, says Samsung, although most of its operations, which now include 55 employees in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Francisco and Minnesota will be moved to Palo Alto to become part of the Samsung Open Innovation Center, or OIC. In the first instance of using mainland China for iCloud account and information storage, Apple has begun using Chinese data centers to store iCloud data for local Apple customers. A municipal government website, Fuzio City Telecom, previously had stated that Apple China has completed the iCloud data dump into China Telecom's cloud services, although that information has since been pulled from the site. Although, moving the site physically closer to China itself obviously gives more reliability, better performance, and uptime speeds for Chinese Apple users. The other side of this, of course, is the potential that moving data into China would make it easier for the Chinese government to spy on users' private data due to the change in regional laws. Mobile car service app Uber has been banned, banned in Berlin by the city's State Department of Civil and Regulatory Affairs on the grounds of passenger safety and that passengers aren't covered by insurance because they aren't in traditional cabs. Uber says it will challenge the ban, although the Berlin Authority has already threatened the company with a 25,000 uh, euro fine, not dollars, for ignoring the order. Uber has been running in Berlin since February of 2013. Now, Uber and competitor car service Lyft are at war with each other. We talked about that earlier in the week. But they do share a common issue, which is fuzzy regulation, depending on where you are. The National League of Cities, which is a group of municipalities throughout the United States, has announced that it will form a new network of startups and cities and academics called the Sharing Economy Advisory Network to, quote, identify the regulatory challenges posed by the disruptive technologies that power the sharing economy. Some of these cities, such as Kansas City, Missouri, say that companies like Uber and Lyft operate as illegal taxis and should face appropriate legislation. Motorola Mobility's Moto 360 smartwatch got some stage time back at Google's I.O. developer conference in June, and now it has an official launch date, September 4th, and an event in Chicago, Illinois. The invitation sent out today features images of a G and X smartphone. Those are probably new versions of the Moto G and Moto X, and an audio accessory, possibly a Bluetooth headset. Motorola is still officially a Google-owned company, but is slated to be acquired by Lenovo. And September is now really shaping up to be a tough month to stand out. Motorola's event is the day after Samsung's multi-city unpacked event, which is expected to unveil the Galaxy Note 4. And then the following week on September 9th, Apple is expected to unveil its new iPhone. If you use YouTube's app on your TV, well, congratulations, because you got yourself a brand new UI. Pretty soon, anyway. The app will reflect Google's new material or flattened design and includes features like a guide that pops up on the left side, latest videos from your subscriptions, and curated channels, kind of like what you would see on the web. The new app is currently available on the Xbox One, and Google says it will plan to roll it out to other devices within the next few weeks. Coming up in just a few, what can a swarm of about 1,000 tiny robots do together without human intervention? I will consider telling you. And up next, Roberto Baldwin from The Next Web is here to take a look into the comments the FCC received on the opened internet. But first, how about talking about some snacks? How about talking about snacking without the guilt? 
some brownies in the kitchen for someone's birthday. I didn't have any of them. You know why? Because I have Nature Box. Nature Box snacks have zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup, and nothing artificial. Nature Box sends great tasting snacks to your door or your office or your home or your, I don't know, maybe you live in a tent. Free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Here's how it works. Click on the continue button to choose between your subscription options, and then you place your order. You can you can choose your dietary need if you have them. Maybe you're vegan. Maybe you need something that's lactose-free, nut-free, non-GMO, all options. And you can also select by taste, savory, sweet, or spicy. I know that snackers have opinions about this. Nature Box has over 100 unique snacks to excite and delight every palate. It's really true. Mexicana mango, anybody? Pumpkin cranberry crave? Citrus kick almonds? I could go on, but I'm not gonna list all 100. Who needs that? Just go to naturebox.com slash twit and get 50% off your first box. And thanks to Naturebox for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, joining us now is Roberto Baldwin, reporter for The Next Web. Hello, Roberto. Hello, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's Thursdays go, can't complain. Uh, I, I mentioned that we were going to talk a little bit about public comments submitted to the FCC. This is, these are comments that the FCC asked for, which is pretty standard, um, to talk about how the, you know, the, the public feels about uh, the idea of the open internet. Now, 1.1 or so million comments came in. Sounds like it crashed. Uh, the, the, the database that the FCC needed to, to, to pull these comments in more than once. So, needless to say, pretty big response. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good day to be an American, really, because, uh, you know, we have this option with the FCC whenever they want to make some changes, you can you can make comments. And I suspect most of the time they probably get a few thousand comments. But when it comes to net neutrality, everyone sort of rallied together, at least, you know, 1.1 1 .1, uh, million people rallied together and uh, left some comments and talked about how, you know, majority of them want an open internet, They you know, they, they support net neutrality. And um, the sort of anti, it's funny because the sort of anti net neutrality uh, uh, comments that they got didn't even really show up on this weird node that, uh, that NPR put together. It's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of artwork and it's a wonderful way to kind of, sh well, I get it, it's a way to show, uh, you know, what was being said in these comments, but there's also instructions on how to use it, how to read it. So that's, you know. Yeah, data, there's a data analysis firm called Quid that apparently parsed hundreds of thousands of these comments looking for, you know, similar terms and, and sentiment and that sort of thing, which is for anybody who's watching the video version of the show, uh, you can you can kind of see, oh, there's you, you start seeing the same things over and over. Do you think that uh, do you think do you think it's kind of a fair assessment of what uh, the the general public of the United States feels or do the pro-net neutrality folks tend to be louder and want to uh, participate more in something like this? I think generally, you know, it's a good, uh, I think it's a good sample of the American public. I mean, I think if you told people that, you know, everyone's kind of been brought up or has understand the internet as this open sort of network where everyone has equal footing, you can start a website and that website can explode and be huge um, and take uh, take down you know a larger website run by a corporation. So I think everyone kind of understands that. And the idea that ISPs could take that away could could you know create these fast lanes, which of course means there's going to be slow lanes. I think people they they see that and they're like, wait, that's not what the internet's all about. That's that's something completely different. That's more like cable TV. And everyone kind of hates cable TV right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I think generally, if you explain it to the average American, the the average American is going to wonder why ISPs would have that sort of control over the, the information we're receiving on the internet. Now, um, among the uh, over a million uh, responses, some of the anti-net neutrality uh, stances came from what looked like form letters or templates. Does that raise any eyebrows? Is that common for something like this? Isn't it supposed to be yeah, fairly organic? I mean, you know, it's it, it, people hate to write. It's yeah. difficult to sort of, you know, it, it, I learned this a long time ago when I was a writer. I was like, oh, well, writing's easy. No, everyone hates writing. Um, and, you know, EFF had a form letter for it as well. So, you know, there was form letters on both sides of the argument. And for some people, it's easier to to just go to a site like the EFF and, and have, you know, their ideas already pretty much written out and just add your name and maybe put a few 
you know, a few comments at the bottom and send it off. So that's not too surprising. And, you know, if, if you can lower the friction to, to, to kind of telling the government or telling anybody how you feel, then, you know, it's more likely you're going to get a lot more uh, respondents. So the volume aside, what's really important now is the FCC asks for these public comments because it's supposed to take into account what America wants, right? It's, you know, the voice of the people. Do you get the sense that most people understand the issues surrounding net neutrality and are, are arguing because they, they do understand the nuances because it can be a somewhat complicated issue? It, you know, it is very... It's it's extremely complicated when you kind of get into the nuances, but the overarching idea is that a company is going to tell you, or it's going to block, and not block, but it's going to give special access to certain other companies. And everyone else will have to deal with the leftovers. And I think people understand that sort of general idea. And I think John Oliver did a great uh, service um, with his video, his, his sort of uh, ex explanation of what it what it really means and you know you can really get down into the weeds with it and and you know the, the classifications and but when it comes to, i think people understand on the higher level what it actually means and for most people that's that's all you really need to know roberto baldwin is a reporter for the next web thanks so much for joining us and let folks know where they can keep up with all the prolific writing that you do oh dear <laughs> um at the next web or you can follow me on twitter down here there's my wait 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 there it is you can follow there me it on is. Twitter. <laughs> and also host of the Ginger Cast, which and also host I'm not gonna, you know, we, we have to we have to mention that too because it's really fun. It's a Every day. it's a, it's a Six vine it's of... a vine version of this show, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Roberto. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Come back soon. Finally, okay, here's something magnificent and also a little bit scary in my opinion, anyway. In a new study published in Science Magazine, researchers at Harvard University created a swarm of 1,024 robots that can assemble themselves into 2D shapes, complex ones, including a star, a wrench, and even the letter K. But here's the kicker, without the need for a central brain or a human controller. So self-assembly happens in nature. Molecules do it, cells form tissues, ants build all the stuff that ants build. But before what's being called the kilobot, you know, for a thousand, most swarms were limited to fewer than 100 robots. So in the latest development, Four special seed robots are added to the edge of the group. They mark the position and orientation of the shape. Then the seed robots emit a message that propagates to the other robots in the blob. And then everyone knows how far away from the seed they are and their relative coordinates. The algorithm accounts for unreliable robots that are pushed out of the, their location or they've been blocked by other robots that are performing their functions. So, you know, it's the beginning of the end, basically. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And Tech News Today will be tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We like to anchor each other. Morning and night. Morning and night. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.